Ladies and gentlemen, I should like to thank first Dr. Annan for his invitation to attend today's gathering. Secondly, two things about the talk to be given. First, there are several dates quoted in it. These are all of the common era. And secondly, although religious references are to theistic religions, I trust that people will be able to make the necessary adjustment mentally to apply to non-theistic. We are limited beings. That's obvious, isn't it, when you think about it? But there are consequences, both humbling and exciting, that can flow from that obvious proposition. As we are limited, our own acquaintance, even with our own faith tradition, its resources and implications will also be limited. This means that no one can be a fully comprehensive encyclopedia of the scriptures, laws, practices, and traditions of her or his own faith, a point that must make for humility. The excitement comes when we accept this. We are ready to learn always and realize that what matters is not how many verses of the Bible or the Vedas or the Quran we may know by heart, how many commentaries we have read or even written, how many sermons or lectures we've been invited to deliver, but how we stand before God. That is an essential human issue, confronting all of us in different ways. This is not a matter of intellectual attainment, but of the whole of life. And we are challenged, especially those of us who professionally represent or teach our faith, by the words of the anonymous 14th century work, The Cloud of Unknowing. By love, God may be, can be caught and held, but by thinking, never. It might be thought that that should put an end to this paper. However, you're not so lucky, for we confront this challenge together. Two distinctions that might re-emerge in the course of the day are worth offering here. First, there is the distinction between mystery and problem. My wife may sometimes be a problem for me, but I hope she will always be a mystery. For a mystery is not some, something to be solved, but it is to be explored. And in our exploring, we are changed by it. We are not to be equipped in order to use it. Knowledge is abused when it, seems, it is seen only as a means of control, of domination. Secondly, within Christian thinking, a distinction is drawn by using a couple of Latin expressions. If you bear with me, please. Fides quae creditor, the faith which is believed and fides qua creditor, the faith by which belief is held. The theologian or philosopher or anthropologist even might be concerned with the former. It is the body of beliefs, creeds, or summaries and definitions of the beliefs that are the focus of a religion. But it is the individual as and where she or he is that is concerned with the latter, the faith by which belief is held or exercised. Simply hearing these distinctions, bearing these distinctions in mind, might help in the understanding of what is to follow in this paper. But now to return to the obvious point with which we started, the fact of human limitation. We're limited by time and place, where we were born, the circumstances into which we were born and in which we grew, the way in which we receive information. And remember that that word means shaping and the kind of information we receive. From within our limited lives, we relate to others, but we also relate to ourselves. And those relationships point to another pair of words, integrity and integration. These are easily used nowadays as though they were automatically positive. Integrity is always a good thing. We must strive for integration, etc. But that is dangerously simplistic. In the 20th century, a wonderful example of integrity, of consistency of character and behavior, 
was Adolf Hitler. And the Nazi party welded a nation in which the integration of millions, integration as readiness without question to play one's part as a cog in the machine, was achieved. These are the extreme cases, I'll grant. But in a world where, on the one hand, fanaticisms of different sorts channel the allegiance of many, and on the other hand, rampant individualism, the assertion that ability to say, I did it my way, relieves the speaker of any other need to justify her or his behavior. We have plenty of warning material. Integrity and integration can be seen as intention, though they also feed one another. We derive the moral standards by which we judge our actions from many sources. And it is by those very judgments that we assess and guard our own integrity. Yet also in a formal academic way, since, if I'm going to be academic, Durkheim's work in the early 20th century and Marx's in the 19th, the problems of lack of integration, the lack of belonging, have been recognized. Though the tension between integrity and integration has been on view certainly in much Western literature, at least since the days of the Greek dramatists. Integrity and sanity are linked. But a few questions such as the following can help with the examination or use of this tension and point towards resolution of some of the moral issues. With what elements of, in my life or experience am I uneasy and why? With what groups does this choice or behavior integrate us or me? Whom does it exclude? What must I give up to achieve integration in a particular situation? That sort of question can be helpful. This tension is reflected in a contrast found within Christian theology, even within the thought of the same theologian. St. Augustine, who died in 430, both searches for God in the mind, in the labyrinth of thought and memory, in examining the relationship between love and knowledge, and talks of human sinfulness as a result of the state in which humanity is curved in on itself. This characterization of sin was to play a major part in the thought of Luther a thousand years later. Again, much teaching on prayer has emphasized the inward. And here the concept of mystery comes in. For Gregory of Nyssa, who died in about 395, stressed that if God is infinite, limited humans cannot expect to get to the end of exploring, growing in love toward the Godhead. So life is not a journey into heaven, but heaven is a journey into God. And that starts here. This theme is found in other writers. In the West, the very title of one of the 13th century Saint St. Bonaventure's books, The Journey of the Mind into God, hints at this. And his thought on the subject is summarized in the proposition that to go into the mind is to ascend to God. It isn't this a way of self-absorption, of complete and inexplicable subjectivism. This is where the feeding, the informing of the mind by the external sources of information, in the broadest sense of the word, is important. And this is where the inner dialogue is important. For it is by the inner dialogue that information is weighed, which is the process we often call conscience. And it is from the inner dialogue that hopes or fears arise. Judgments of our experiences and judgments of other people are shaped. It's possible to see the espousal of easy prejudices, in the pejorative sense of that word, as a fruit of failure to engage in inner dialogue. For it is the direct assent to external assessments for no discernible reason. Here, integrity is sacrificed to integration. At a level 
lower than the analytically intellectual. Human beings have a range of feelings, needs, fears, drives and intuitions that carry the baby from crying in order to be fed to the recognition that if she or he is to continue to be fed as an older child or teenager, crying is not the best way to achieve the goal. Teenagers change, don't they? Hillary and I agreed the other week when he was talking about his teenage son, euthanasia, the right of every parent to choose which of their teenage children they will kill. It was a good idea. But anyway, to return. The intuition or reflex of crying and then the need to belong make the transition not a deliberate choice coming as a result of weighing options, but is just part of the process of socialization, which happens, for good or ill, largely at the non-conscious level. That much is hack psychology. But the basic needs do not go away. Rather, they grow into more subtle demands. The need for security, which is met, in the case of the infant, by the provision of food or a hug or a blanket, leads to the quest for security in religious belief. It must be stressed that this way of speaking does not undermine the veracity of religious propositions any more than the fact that the baby needs milk makes the milk non-existent. The non-believer is also seeking security, but of a different sort. There is a psychological impulse towards both knowledge and security. For knowledge can give security and lead to wonder, which is the main foundation of true joy. But both these goals are necessarily social. Our security as individuals can only exist as we are secure within our social environment. And knowledge demands relationship. Even the mathematician who has discovered a new formula can only claim to know because that formula somehow fits the body of mathematical formulae already held in common by the community of mathematicians. Knowledge can be acquired as a means to security, but such instrumental knowledge needs to be checked, for when it becomes the tool of unrecognized or potentially destructive urges, it needs another kind of knowledge, knowledge of what it means to be human. Among the sources of information, the shaping influences exerted on the individual and often on the wider community come religious influences. We may be here today because we represent different faith traditions, but we don't come only as religious believers. We have each of us been shaped by factors other than those narrowly defined as religious, as well as by our faith. Yet, we are mistaken if we think all the other kinds of information are easily subjected to our religious judgment for a final scrutiny. To say that is to limit God. The one at work in revealing the scriptures of any faith cannot be separated from the one at work in creating and sustaining creation. And the means of investigation in different cases must be allowed to be different. To say otherwise is to limit God. And this leads to the first positive point about the inner dialogue, and one which we may perhaps be able to develop. That is that our urge for security, when it leads to seeking security by means of control, can be dangerous. Of course we want knowledge to fight illnesses, one form of control, or to construct buildings, another kind of knowledge intended to help control. But knowledge to be knowledge must be knowledge of truth. And no truth will go away, however inconvenient it may be for our security. We are limited, but the religious believer can say that security lies not only in knowing, but in being known. That, however, is to race ahead. Among those things that we know, we cannot avoid knowledge of other faiths. Such knowledge may threaten our security. 
For it is hard to say that one has been wrong about the most fundamental of commitments, commitment to God. But it is the awareness of God as working outside the confines of our own faith that makes for caution. We may smugly say as Christians that Islam is untrue whilst Christianity is true. But we are discovering. And in religious matters, we begin with a recognition that has to come sooner or later in all processes of learning. That we are smaller than that that we seek to explore. Once that has been said, we must ask why we dismiss elements of other faiths. Even those of us who maintain an orthodox position within our own faith community can see that that faith is shaped by historical and social conditions in its origins. The insights of other faiths may help us to see our own faith in a different light, but may also resource our own spiritual journeys. Each faith has had to evolve and is still evolving. Christianity did not spring up from the earth as something new. It only makes sense as it has been shaped by the Judaism whose God it claims to share. The Hinduism of the Vedas has flowed into a variety of channels, each claiming to be Hindu and, here an example for all of us I believe, ready to see the other channels as Hindu. Judaism itself has evolved in the application of law and the channeling of aspirations, and in the critique of those aspirations. Buddhism has emerged from Hinduism and then diversified, partly as a result of encounter with other faiths in the land visited by the earliest Buddhist missionaries. Islam has had to confront diversification and is faced with its own ecumenical challenge, whilst it recognizes continuity with the faith of Abraham. But how is the inner dialogue to be conducted? Honesty is primary. Honesty that we address issues as already members of a faith community, but also honesty that, as was remarked earlier, none of us has complete knowledge of our own faith, nor does the whole body of believers together. Within those religions that treasure revelation, the voice from outside is fundamental. And though the work of the revealer may be ended, as all who have received the revelation are limited, the process of revelation continues. It is not only the economic need for preachers to keep themselves in work that makes the question, what does this passage of scripture mean? One that impels us to reread our scriptures again and again. But it is appropriate, however untidy, to end with a few examples of the inner dialogue. Before doing so, it must be stressed that faiths do not enter into dialogues, only people. And that what is offered here comes from one whose Christianity is limited and whose knowledge of other faiths is even more limited. A certain naivety is inevitable, but not one that would refuse correction. A Christian prayer from the 16th century runs, Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labour and not to ask for any reward, except that of knowing that we do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Might that not be set alongside the Bhagavad Gita's call to act, but to renounce the fruits of action. In the New Testament, we read of St. Paul and his companions on a missionary journey. When they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Any Christian needs to accept that her or his plans are not always God's. But might she or he not be enriched by knowing one name of Allah, Amuachir, the retarder. In the Gospel according to St John, we read the words of Jesus that the Spirit blows where it will. The remark comes in a setting where Jesus could be drawing his listeners' attention to the wind. It is not fanciful to find here a parallel to the words of the Isha Upanishad 
It moves and it moves not. It is far and it is near. It is within all this and it is also outside all this. In the same of Hanishad, but here the quotation is from a different person's version, occur the words, who sees all beings in his own self and his own self in all beings loses all fear. There is a meeting point here between these words and the words in the first letter of St. John in the New Testament, perfect love casts out fear. These are a few examples chosen almost at random. Each has been a starting point for longer reflection, but they show how for one believer, faith has been enriched by encounter with other faiths, without compromising integrity, but also in, as a way of aiding integration by understanding. In all our traditions, law has a place. I look forward to hearing a Hindu exposition of Psalm 19, but that might be a project to follow up some other day. We must be honest about our differences, of course, but we must surely rejoice in what we can share. And perhaps we need to remember that whatever we believe, God is bigger. After all, if that were not so, eternity would become boring. So I'll meet you, ladies and gentlemen.